Last time on Talking Point 60, I announced that there would be an episode geared all towards anime. Omar immediately got excited, and Josh told me, well, let's get this episode rolling. So, with all that being said, let's get talking. So, welcome back, y'all. Here we're here in the talk cave. It's a sweltering 80 degrees today, uh, and this is one of the rooms that doesn't have air conditioning. Oh, joy. So, anyway, uh, yeah. Welcome to today's episode of Talking Points. Bear with me, I may stutter and stammer a little bit, but today's episode will be geared all towards anime. And by that we mean anime that has inspired me to kind of follow it more, you know, follow that art style a little more. You know, I enjoy watching anime, so the, I, fig I figured most of our fans are big anime nuts out there, which apparently y'all are. You, A lot of y'all answered this right away. Uh, you know, We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about anime franchises that have inspired multiple forms of media with like games and movies and live action stuff and even western adaptations of it. Uh, we'll also talk about anime that has developed a, that was developed based on western media, you know, the animes that really built off of western series and series from the western universe that are the western art styles that were inspired mostly by anime. Now we'll talk about the creators that have built a cult following, and uh, we'll get on to the discussion of subbed versus dubbed anime. After that, we'll get to the talking points segment, and now that we've said all that, let's get talking. So, what really pushed me as an anime fan had to be just growing up and when we finally got a hold to satellite television, because where I live basic television is so hard to come by because of the weather and uh, distance from any local channels that uh, my parents really were like damn it let's just go ahead and spend the money and get the satellite system set up so we you know we got that and I immediately fell in love with Cartoon Network you know I was a young kid at the time Cartoon Network was so much more entertaining to me than the kid stuff of Disney and the nonsense of Nickelodeon even though Nickelodeon did have a few good shows uh, but the first anime I really got into was G-Force. If you never saw G-Force, each of the characters had helmets that were shaped like, that had bird shapes to them. Like one was a falcon, one was an owl, a uh, couple of other characters, but they they flew around in jets. And that was, to me that was pretty fucking cool. I mean, it, it, it fueled my imagination for, okay, American cartoons tended to be more pirates or, you know, fantasy based or anything like that. This would, for me, this was, you know, modern to futuristic ideas. Uh, after, after G-Force, I started getting, I, I lost my interest in it for a while. There were no real animes out there that really caught my attention. And then Toonami came along. And if you've never watched anything on Cartoon Network back in the 90s to the early 2000s, Toonami, and they just brought back Toonami. But anyway, Toonami was its was a big fucking deal back in the day. I mean, you'd get home from school and there'd be uh, Gundam, Inuyasha, DBZ. I mean, just the list goes on. You know, there were so many different animes. I, I mean, and that's just it. Inuyasha, Gundam, DBZ, Cowboy Bebop, Shin-Chan, and other series really were introduced to me thanks to Cartoon Network's push with anime. And I mean... You know, and then there was also Encore, which, you know, for American viewers, Encore, or for you non-American viewers, Encore is basically, like, a channel based, that's, it's a, cha it's a set of channels basically dedicated to the older movies and shows. Well, Encore Action would do an anime block every uh, weekend from, mid from, like, 10 till about 2 in the morning, and it would be, like, Bubblegum Crisis, and... Gunsmith Cats and Dirty Pair and I mean all these animes that were really not supposed to be viewed by teen not by small kids but by teenagers. By that point, I was a teenager, so I mean I understood what I was watching. You know, wasn't like it was you know there was it's not like you know some anime like hentai. You know, no, it was nothing like that. It was all action based and blood and guts and nudity and 
all of those things that make anime so different than American cartoons because you can have the cutesy like this Chocobo here from any kind of Final Fantasy cartoon that came out. You got the more middle middle of the class middle of the road here with Shin Chan. You've got the Gundams, which were all about the action, but very little blood gore and all that explosions. There was death involved, but you know it wasn't anything like that. And then you know once the internet age really took off as well as it did, and we and everybody started getting DSL and T1 lines and all that. You got streaming media, and of course some of it's pirated. But you know stream streaming video really brought to us almost a whole world of anime we missed. I mean, there was things that I learned about, like, you know, a lot of it's etchy, which is, etchy is more geared towards men and teenage boys, but you got stuff like Girls Bravo, Heaven's Lost Property, Chobits, Gunsmith Cats, Bubblegum Crisis again, you know, there's multiple Bubblegum Crisis, Clan Ed, which, oh my god, if you've never watched Clan Ed, that is an emotional, just, it hits you in the gut, and uh, Freezing other other animes out there I mean there's so many I can name you know that just aren't you know that are that are out there like Sword Art Online I never really found out about that until the streaming service and then it came on the Cartoon Network and other things like that but you know we'll continue on but those are I mean that's where everybody gets their chance to actually view this stuff is through websites Netflix Cartoon Network still doing it Disney now does it. Nickelodeon sometimes will pick up one or two, but you know it's it's really been a big push to get Japanese art forms over here. Uh, if you really want to look at the anime anime franchises that have pretty much spawned everything, I mean, for instance, Gundam. We'll go with that first. Gundam brought out a huge following over here in America, and with that following came a model franchise that really, I mean. Every kid out there had to go pick up a Gundam model, and, and you know, in my group, and mine was always Death Scythe. I loved Death Scythe. I loved Wing Zero. I liked all of this, and this is, you know, it was it was enjoyable to sit there and watch Gundam, and then all of a sudden the toy the toy line would come out, and you'd be like, I gotta have this. I gotta get this. And then they had the trading card game. I mean, then they had video games like Gundam Battle Assault and Mobile Suit Gundam Zeonic Front and Dynasty Warriors Gundam. I mean, they even mashed that together. So, I mean, it was pretty awesome. You had people cosplaying as the characters from any of the series. Like, for instance, you have a lot of people that like to go as Hiro Yui or Duo Maxwell or Catch for a Rababa Winner. I mean, yeah, I, I, I knew most of those names because that was my series, man. I could not miss an episode of Gundam Wing when I was a kid. Uh, DBZ, for instance, has inspired live action movies. A whole franchise of movies in their own that f pretty much just, they weren't the greatest DBZ movies, but you know, that was, they were still DBZ movies. And then you had games and action figures and stuff like that. And uh, then you had Sailor Moon, there were stat statuettes and other things like that that girls really wanted to get. I mean, there was like... Every, Sailor Moon purses, stuffed animals, stuffed toys, and then Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu-Gi-Oh! Pokemon, all of those games that really focused on fighting monsters and dueling monsters. And Yu-Gi-Oh! was based all around a card game. Or it was it was an anime, it was a manga, then it was an anime, then it was a card game, something. I can't remember how it went, but, you know, I remember watching the anime and all of a sudden the card game became popular and everybody was like, oh, I gotta go get these cards. And it was so cool to finally collect like Blue Eyes White Dragon and all these all these big ones that they always summon. I mean the Exodia set. Now that one, if you ever got a hold of that, you fucked everybody's day up. Uh, you know there was countless things that these animes, and like I said, most anime spawns from manga, which manga is the written you know the comic book, whereas anime is the video style. But, you know, talking about the merchandise, I mean, we even have, you know, like this here, collectibles. Collectibles became the big thing when anime really took off. Like I said, stuffed animals, model kits, collectibles. I mean, even little mini collectibles. 
and collectible badges like with Pokemon. I mean, everybody really got into the whole, you know, anime craze at one point in time. But now that we've said that, let's get into the anime that was inspired by Western media and Western media that inspired anime. Or anime that was, in, or Western media that was inspired by anime is what I should say. So anyway, we start off with the anime that was inspired by Western media by, with Halo Legends. I mean, if you never watched Halo Legends, a bunch of anime artists got together, I think even in, including a... Uh, the group that does a lot of the Dragon Ball Z stuff even made one for Halo. Uh, and took, you know, the Halo story and Halo characters and made some awesome backstory movie, movie animes and then some very kind of funny, kid-friendly, joking Halo jokes with uh, some of theirs. Uh, I really enjoyed that. that. To me, that showed that the Japanese artist really had a concept or really had a grasp of the concept that is Halo. Another one that I saw was Animatrix. If you've never watched the Animatrix, it's not one single movie, but a collection of movies like Halo Legends that takes the world of the Matrix and turns it into this animated artwork that's so vibrant and so awesome. I mean, if you never get the chance, if you ever get the chance to watch it, it's worth it. Uh, for Western series that really took inspiration from anime. We have Avatar The Last Airbender. I mean, if you've ever watched that, the anime was awesome. The movie? M. Night Shyamalan dropped the ball on that for me. Uh, ben 10, The Boondocks, which The Boondocks itself, Aaron Magruder took a lot of inspiration from the Japanese art style and made a cartoon that feels like an anime but has a Western, you know, Western origin to it. And then you had Star Wars Clone Wars, which George Lucas himself, before selling out to Disney, you know, you asshole, uh, pretty much just made this series, uh, it's not The Clone Wars, but Star Wars Clone Wars was a 2D art, was a 2D anime style, whereas The Clone Wars was 3D and it wasn't, you know, it didn't, it took what it, it took what Clone Wars did and built around it. So... You know, that's pretty much it for that part. We'll get on now to the directors who have shaped the anime scene in the West. I mean, these these guys, these creators, these artists, they really made anime so popular in the West. For instance, we can't go without saying, Haya, I'm, I'm going to butcher this name, Hayao Miyazaki. Miyazaki, if you've ever seen anything from Studio Ghibli, or Ghibli, or... Again, I'm butchering everything Japanese at this point. Uh, his anime is like My Neighbor Totoro and Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away and uh, Kiki's Magical Broom. I, I can't remember that one, but you know I've seen a bunch of them. And I'm going to tell you right now, Miyazaki's work has earned him the right to be called the Walt Disney of Japan or the Steven Spielberg or any other accolade he's received. I mean, this man has made anime just beautiful. And he adds a, you know, rather than being just strong male lead character every time you get a strong female lead or you get a story that's so emotionally driven or so you can tell what inspired him to make this and it just it's so awesome. Um, again, we can't go without saying Akira Toriyama. You know, Toriyama is an artist more than he is the director for the series, but without Toriyama, we wouldn't have DBZ, we wouldn't have Dragon Quest, we wouldn't have Chrono Trigger the way that they were. You know, we'd have just generic characters in, in anything if they decided to go with this, but DBZ really was his baby. That was his idea, his concept. And he started out with the Dragon Ball manga and moved it into the anime franchise. And I mean, when he started animating, that's when he really opened up the Western world to this concept of, I can make anime characters that are quirky, big-eyed, and awesome, and at the same time funny, and, you know, just weirdly designed, non, you know, very humanoid-like creatures like Frieza and Cell and... 
you know, members of the Ginyu squad and all that. You know, it's been so long since I watched Dragon Ball Z, I can't remember all the races, but I mean, you've got, he created everything in that universe and made it so much different than what we have with some anime characters. Some anime characters, you know, you get that same serious male looking character, and quirky big boobed female character. No, he took, he made them all shapes, all sizes, all designs, everything. I mean, you got Piccolo, everything like that, you know, I mean, it just, it's awesome. So, you know, those two directors I really wanted to point out the most, or were the ones that I wanted to point out the most, I should say, because they were two of the greatest ones that have ever come out this, you know, come, that have pushed their media to the West. Uh, with that being said, we'll move on now to the one of the best arguments I've heard for the anime craze, which is the subbed versus dubbed argument. Now, I know everybody out there has their favorite. You know, some are team subbed, subtitled, or some are team dubbed, where there's a Western actor, Western voice actor, or a voice actor from, a, from another country, tran you know, speaking, reading the translated script, although kind of poorly translated with some of them, like Shin Chan. Um, but, you know, it, it's not so much, I like, I like both styles, to be honest with you, so I really can't say that I'm either or, but in all honesty, there are pros and cons to each. Let's start with the sub. Pros, you get the voice actors that tend to match the character the way it was designed, and the emotions whenever the character speaks, and, you know, it, it, everything fits that anime so well with that. The cons are that sub can take away from everything happening in the background because some of these animators are cheeky and like to throw little background pics in there that you, if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss. And, I mean, for instance, if you ever tried to watch Fooly Cooly subbed, it's difficult because you're having to look up and down and constantly make sure you're not missing anything. But then you get the dub voice actors who, you know, some of them are really good. I mean, Stephen Blum, for instance, the man is, or Bloom, I, I, don't, I don't know how you say his last name. I, I have a hard time pronouncing things like that. But, you you know, you have him who speaks, who plays Spike Spiegel. And, I mean, just the, you, if you've ever heard, and Tom from Toonami and all of that. But, you know, it these voice actors, they try to match this character to a T. But sometimes you get a voice actor that's just, where are you going? What are you doing to match the voice? Or to match the mouth movement? And to me, that just, that takes away from the anime. That just takes all the emotion out of the character. Uh, I mean, we get, and also, like I said, we sometimes get poor translations of animes. So, you know, for instance, you get the name Lena a lot when it's Rena and you know so on and so forth but uh yeah that's pretty much it for the sub versus dub argument i'm not going like i said i'm not going to fuel a flame war here of you know sub dub versus dub this is better this is better i just gave you my points on that so now that we got all that out of the way let's move on to the talking point segment of our show last week we asked you the viewers to name your favorite anime or series well we got a lot of answers and a lot of long-winded answers so uh We'll start off with Katie, who writes, This is a Zombie was a great anime, but I also love Attack on Titan. I've seen Attack on Titan. That is an epic one. I mean, it really does, and I, I didn't name it in the episode, but and I feel like an asshole for not doing that. You know, I get the asshole of the uh, year award here. But, you know, it is a good series. I've never seen This is a Zombie, so I may have to check that one out, Katie. Thank you for the uh, hint there. Omar writes, Currently, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Gwen Saga, Gwen Saga I, I, yeah, I don't know if I'm saying that one right, Shiguri Death Frenzy, Gantz, and New Fist of the North Star. All-time faves are G Gundam, Robot Carnival Beach, Ninja Scroll, Darkstalkers, DBZ, of course. I mean, hell, almost everybody on here said DBZ. So, uh, Slam Dunk, Bio Booster Giver, which Giver is also pretty awesome. I, I like that. And G Gundam, no, uh, Omar. So far, you've got two of two on the list here, or three of three on the list with DBZ. Uh, let's see. Where was that? Okay, there we go. Galaxy Rangers, Mighty Orbots. I, I don't know if that's supposed to be robots or Orbots, but you know, it, it may be a typo. Uh, Madhouse, Madhouse is X Men. Machine Robo. 
The storyline and animation have been impressive and harmonious. And he says, Machine Robo. He gets really excited about this one and says, The story and the animation have been have to be impressive and harmonious for me to call it a true traditional anime. I'm showing my age, as I normally do with these comments. LOL. Yeah, you tend to do that a lot, Omar. But hey, that's what makes you awesome. Uh, but the drawing style of the 80s and 90s compared to the stuff today is really day and night. Take a classic like Ninja Scroll, for instance. The style, the action, the storyline, it was a true masterpiece. Alex writes, DBZ. Noah says, Gundam Wing and DBZ. Emily says, DBZ. Taylor writes, DBZ and Blood. Jen writes, too many to name that I've enjoyed, but one the one that comes to mind the most was Shin-Chan. But I enjoy everything from darker animes like Devil May Cry and Elfin Lead, which Elfin Lead, Jen got me into Elfin Lead. That was dark, but at the same time, an emotional roller coaster. And she says she likes things like Trigun, Chobits, Girls Bravo, Heaven's Lost Property, and Rosario Plus Vampire, among others. Never really got into DBZ or any other mainstream medias. She also had to mention DBZ. Apparently, everybody has to... And Nicole also joins in with DBZ. So apparently all of you like DBZ. Like I said, DBZ was one of those that everyone saw, everyone watched, and everyone truly enjoyed it. It was for guys, girls, you know, young, old. I don't, well, not too old, because I, I don't know a lot of older people that watch DBZ, but still. You know, for and thanks, thanks to all of you for your fancers out there. For our team sirs, we have... Misty, who writes, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon, and in case I didn't mention it before, Sailor Moon, oh, and High School of the Dead. High School of the Dead's fucking amazing, and Sailor Moon, 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 and Sailor Moon, yeah, they're all pretty awesome, too. Uh, but anyway, getting back, Josh says, DBZ, High School of the Dead. Inuyasha, old school po Pokemon, Pokemon, first, second, or third seasons and movies. You know, because after that he says it starts going. Shoom. Just the story you can you can tell it gets predictable then. Uh, old school Digimon, the first two se seasons, Cowboy Bebop and Ruby, and that's spelled R W B Y, but it's Ruby, which believe it or not, Ruby was actually made by the guys over, or it was inspired by the guys over at. Uh, Rooster Teeth, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, Josh told me about that the other day. I, you know, I'd have to go look that up to be sure, but I'm not going to doubt Josh's facts because he's pretty knowledgeable on all things like internet. So, so anyway, that ends uh, last week's talking point. This week we have a new one for you, and since next week is Star Wars week or Star Wars Day, coming up on May 4th, you know, May the 4th be with you. We uh, we ask you, the viewers to name your f favorite lesser-known Star Wars character. Now for me, I, now for what I mean by this is, you know, everybody knows Boba Fett. Boba Fett's out there. He's He's got thousands of things Boba Fett. There's t-shirts like mine, you know. You really can't see that, but it's Boba Fett. Uh, but you don't get a lot of stuff with the other bounty hunters. I mean, I got IG-88, Bosk, Dengar, Zuckus, Forlom, you know, all of them pretty much didn't get much time at all. There was like one or two scenes that they were in, and after that, pff, no more. But their backstory in the Star Wars Legends stuff just really, what well, it really opened up, a char up characters that people had liked. I mean, I love the Bounty Hunters. And you got Zam Wessel, you know, who was in episode two or three, I think episode two. Um... But most of the, like I said, most of that stuff's been relegated to the legend status, so fuck you, Disney. None of that matters anymore, according to you. Yeah. Uh, there was also Darth Revan. I mean, Revan was really, he was one of the first ones to really get that whole dark to light, light to dark rotation. He was one of the, you know, one of the characters that a lot of, you see a lot of people cosplaying as, too. So, you know, he's really an awesome character. That's, I mean, that's really how I found out about him, was through cosplayers. I was like, whoa, what's up with this guy with the Mandalorian mask? Find out he's actually a, uh, he's actually a Jedi turned Sith turned Grey Jedi, I think, towards the end. But, you know, we want to know what's your answer for this. 
You can answer below in the comments, or you can go to our Facebook and Twitter pages. The website's still being worked on, folks, so bear with us on that. Well, that concludes today's episode. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and check out our new improved merch shop. Also, make sure you join us live tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Time as we dive into Aliens Day 426 with a live playthrough of Alien Isolation. I'll be, I'll be manning the controls for that. Josh will be handling the chat. you got to stay tuned and watch that. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching, and as always, keep talking. Hey, thanks for watching today's episode. If you liked, uh, if you liked this show, you can uh, click on these Dragon Balls to summon the subscribe button. Or if you want to continue on, or if you want to continue on your quest and watch another video with us, you can always click here on these Pokemon badges to uh, watch another video with us.